So they will then get from Pedro Jagannath. Pedro Jagannath is supervised by myself. I have the Quran Bridge Boha. She's looking at using low cost catalyst reproduction of biodiesel. Now, Pedro did her BSc in chemistry and management and her MSc in petroleum engineering at UB. Right? She also works at Kaiser Environmental Services, Tucker Energy, and for Petrogen. So, um, Phaedra has a lot of experience in the area of fuels, right? And now she likes to do something which is more progressive, which is alternative fuels. Today, Phaedra will share with us some of um, her work, and let's welcome her. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Phaedra Jagannath. I'm completing an MPhil, hoping to upgrade to a PhD. My supervisors are Dr. E.J. John and Dr. Puran Bridgmahan. And the title of my presentation is The Use of Low-Cost Environmentally Friendly Catalyst in Biodiesel Production. My agenda for today is, first of all, to have an introduction, just to talk a little bit exactly as to what is biodiesel and why would we want to use biodiesel. Then some of the challenges in biodiesel production and which specific challenge or problem that I would like to address, and what sort of previous research that was done globally on that particular problem, and then to get a little more specific into my research goal, my methodology, and a summary of the entire presentation. So first of all, what is biodiesel? And the technical term is that biodiesel is monoalkyl esters of long chain fatty acids. But biodiesel is really produced by a reaction called transesterification, which is really taking the triglycerides from any source of um, oil or fats and reacting with an alcohol, usually methanol, to produce any sort of esters as well as glycerol as a byproduct. So this transesterification reaction is a very important reaction in biodiesel production. Biodiesel also must be able to fulfill certain characteristics that would enable it to be used in a compression ignition engine, which is really a diesel engine. I want to talk a little bit more about the transesterification reaction because it is a very important reaction. And this is it really. Um, those are the chemical formulae. Now you have one molecule of triglyceride reacting with three of the alcohol to produce your alkyl esters, three molecules, and one molecule of glycerol. And this reaction was first used because people did try to use raw vegetable oil in engines and found that the viscosity was too high. So what we're really doing is taking that very big molecule of the triglyceride and breaking it down to three smaller alkyl ester molecules, which is what you're seeing happening here. <clears throat> so the transesterification reaction is really supposed to address that problem of high viscosity of the vegetable oils. Now, within the reaction, we normally use a catalyst and certain experimental conditions, including adding some heat, usually around six degrees Celsius. But the catalyst is something that I really want to talk about and is very important within that transesterification reaction. And usually use sodium hydroxide as the typical sort of um, catalyst that is used in industrial applications. This is some um, biodiesel that was prepared by us in Waterloo in the laboratory. And you see that this is really how um, your glycerol is separated from your esters. Your glycerol is heavier, so it settles at the bottom. Your biodiesel is a little bit lighter, so it's at the top. So what you really do is that once it's settled and separated, you remove the glycerol. But having done that, the esters still contain some of the catalyst. So you need to wash it in order to remove that extra catalyst. And having washed it, you have added water, so you also need to dry it. So once you've done that, this is what some of the biodiesel looks like. So this is some refined biodiesel that we made from coconut oil in the lab using sodium hydroxide. So now that we know exactly what is biodiesel, the question we might ask now is, why use biodiesel? Okay. <laughs> so one second. Right, why use biodiesel? The first thing is that biodiesel is first of all a liquid fuel alternative to petrodiesel. And a couple of things I want to just focus on there. First of all, it's an alternative, it's not a substitute. It's not intended to replace every single 
use of petroleum. It's really an alternative. It, it's also a liquid fuel. And for those who might be asking why we're looking at biodiesel, considering we have to look at catalyst for that, for that process, we also have to look at adding some sort of heat for the process. Why would we look at biodiesel, considering that we have the ultimate renewable resources of solar energy, wind energy, and wave energy? And this is the reason. It's because it's a liquid fuel. And this is very important when we consider that most of our transportation is based on some sort of liquid fuel engine. And it becomes extremely important in countries that are a lot bigger than, say, Trinidad, where we have huge urban cities and food producing areas are very far from that area. So in order for these huge cities with you know, a lot of pop a very dense population, you need to transport the food from those urban, those food producing areas via some sort of um, usually trucks that run on diesel. And if it is that there are problems with any sort of liquid fuel production, it would tend to indirectly affect food production to those areas as well. So it becomes very important when you consider that it's a liquid fuel alternative. It's also more just ask you to speak a little bit slowly. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay. No problem. It's also more sustainable in the long term. It's a renewable source, and I think we're all aware of the fact that petroleum is a finite, it's a finite source, a resource, and it's going to at some point in time be depleted. So it is more renewable, it's more sustainable in the long term, simply because it is, its sources are from the triglycerides and vegetable oils, and it can also come from um, non-food sources such as waste oils or from animal fats. Biodiesel also has some environmental advantages in that it has less greenhouse emissions than diesel, less smoke and particle emissions. In terms of the properties itself that makes it more um, that makes it applicable to a diesel engine, there are some advantages as well. For example, biodiesel has a higher flash point than diesel, about 150 degrees Celsius compared to diesel's 77 degrees Celsius. And when you consider that a flash point is the point at which your liquid forms an ignitable mixture in air and any spark would produce an explosion, then you can see that that is a safety consideration. So it's better to have a much higher flash point than a lower flash point. It also has a higher CT number, which gives it a better ignition quality. And biodiesel also has better lubricity than diesel, approximately 66% better lubricity. So now that we've looked at all these advantages, then the question would be exactly why doesn't every single gas station have a biodiesel pump? And the main reason is that there are some challenges, including the higher price. Biodiesel is approximately 50 cents per liter compared to petrodiesel, which is 35 cents per liter. And even though it might not sound like a big difference, because that is about 15 cents per liter more than petrodiesel, when you consider that you have to fill up your gas tank, and my gas tank uses about 32 liters, and then you might want to fill that up every week over a long period of time. It adds up, and it's something that the consumer will feel, and something that they would definitely look at with some, um, with some query. The next challenge is that the final product quality still has some challenges with it. Even though there are advantages, as mentioned before, such as the higher flash point, um, higher CT number, better lubricity, it still has, the biodiesel still has a higher viscosity compared to diesel. So that is a bit of a concern. It also has higher cloud and pour points, and this becomes especially a concern when you consider high altitude applications where you have low temperatures. Biodiesel normally has approximately 15 to 25 degrees Celsius higher cloud and pour points than diesel. And when you consider that how a cloud and pour point is the point at which your diesel start, stops to flow, you don't want your engine stolen, especially at those high, high altitudes um, with hundreds of passengers on your plane if it is that you have a higher cloud and pour point. So it is a safety concern in those applications. It's also um, a concern in um, more temperate climates, not really a concern in tropic climates. 
It also has a poor oxidative stability. Um, this concerns the storage of biodiesel. Um, it starts to degrade quicker, so it can't be stored for excessively long periods of time. However, there is the, the flip side of that, which is that um, if there are any spills of biodiesel, you don't have to worry as much as if there are oil spills of petrodiesel. A next disadvantage is that emissions of nitrogen oxides are increased with biodiesel. So those are some challenges. But the challenge that I really want to focus on in my research is the higher cost of the biodiesel. And this really affects the whole aspect of sustainability of biodiesel preparation. Because if people don't want to purchase biodiesel, there's no real incentive to be preparing biodiesel, producing biodiesel. I want to focus especially on the inputs at the laboratory level that impact on cost. The feedstock, alcohol, catalyst, and the energy source. And of these, the one that we'll be focused on is the catalyst. In terms of what catalysts are currently being used in biodiesel production, they're really what are termed homogeneous catalysts, which just really means that they are in the same physical state as the reactants. Our reactants are oil and methanol, which are both liquid, and these catalysts are liquid as well. So that's why they're homogeneous catalysts. So usually very strong acids and bases, for example, the acids are sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, bases like sodium hydroxide, and some of the problems with these catalysts are, first of all, they're pretty expensive to procure. For example, it was estimated that 88 tons of sodium hydroxide were used to produce 8,000 tons of biodiesel. And for those of us who have to purchase sodium hydroxide, we know that even a very small bottle of 500 grams is about $225 TT. So it works out to be pretty expensive. It can also be corrosive to equipment because you're dealing with very, very strong acids and strong bases. So you tend to have to replace that equipment, which is an additional cost. Because they're liquids, because they're homogeneous catalysts, they're difficult to separate from your resultant biodiesel. You tend to have to, to wash it with water in order to remove any sort of catalyst that remains within your biodiesel. And that comes to the last um, problem, which is environmental concerns. Having produced that volume of wash water that is highly caustic, you now have to dispose of it. And in some countries, that actually carries a financial cost. And if it doesn't carry a financial cost, you would have some sort of environmental concerns. So the proposed solution to this is that we have some low cost, environmentally friendly, heterogeneous catalysts. Heterogeneous meaning that it's in a different physical state from the reactants, so it's simply a solid catalyst. So instead of washing to get rid of the catalyst, you could just simply filter. Some examples that we're specifically looking at with regards to transesterification is using some sorts of low-cost, environmentally-friendly cat catalysts that primarily contain calcium carbonate in the natural state and undergo some sort of chemical change to be perform as a more effective catalyst. In this case, we use calcination, which is simply heating at a very high temperature in a high-temperature furnace in order to have this reaction occur, which is that your calcium carbonate, uh, the cal carbon dioxide is removed from the calcium carbonate, and you have calcium oxide remaining. And this is a much better catalyst than the calcium carbonate because having removed the carbon dioxide, you more have more pores available, more sites available for the reaction to occur. And some examples of these types of catalysts are eggshells, oyster shells, and crab shells. And some work has previously been done globally on these particular catalysts. For example, some work on eggshells was done in China by Wei Zhuan Li. Some work on oyster shells by Nakatani et al. in Japan. Some work on crab shells on Bowie et al. in Malaysia. And these have been done, well, first of all, they've been done pretty recently. All these papers are in 2009, so it's very recent research. And what they really tried to do was they tried to not just find a low-cost alternative, but also utilize some of the waste that was produced within their countries. For example, in China, they estimated that over 4 million tons of eggshells were, were used per year in the landfill. So they found those things, and also these countries are countries that are not known as being very petroleum rich. So that has been really um, uh, helping their research along. So based on their research, they found that 
This particular catalyst had a good yield, a good purity, comparable properties to diesel, and good reusability. And reusability is very important because it also decreases your cost. Once it is that you can reuse your catalyst, you can decrease your cost instead of adding new catalyst. In fact, Weizhou and Li found that they could have reused their catalyst 13 times. So based on their conclusions, we can see that there is some sort of, there is hope really to um, have continued research into these catalysts. So my research goal therefore is to identify viable, low-cost, environmentally friendly catalysts found in Trinidad and Tobago, which can be used in biodiesel production, which will then decrease the overall cost felt by the consumer. My methodology is first of all to complete that transesterification reaction, which is reacting the triglycerides with the alcohol with different low-cost, environmentally friendly, locally derived catalysts. It's also to determine the best options as potential catalysts to complete catalyst characterization analyses, which is really just figuring out what its physical properties are, to compare the results and examine for relationships. And in summary, biodiesel is an attractive alternative to petrodiesel. However, a major challenge is the cost of its production. And one factor contributing to the cost is the cost of the homogeneous catalyst, which is your sulfuric acid, your hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, both the procurement and the disposal of the wastewater. Previous research indicates that the use of low-cost environmentally friendly catalysts, such as the eggshells, oyster shells, address this concern whilst ensuring that biodiesel production is still economically feasible. And my research will focus on the use of local, low-cost catalysts in biodiesel production. So thank you for your time and attention. Are there any questions? Well, one that we looked at was um, what is called chip chip. Uh, it's found in the sea. It's kind of like a very tiny oyster, I suppose. It's, it's a kind of an oyster. Yes. It's a yes, it's called Donata striatus, I think. That's the proper term for it. So that's chip chip. So that's that one. Um, we also looked at not just organic sources, but also sources at um, from soils, different rocks. There's Mars rocks that are used by TCL. So then. Uh, because in Egypt, for example, we have these mountains of calcite material, which we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, so, so any kind of a calcite, that's what I understand. Mm -hmm. You can look also at some kind of minerals or some calcite compounds, which we can take and be refined in a way to, to, to use it in a similar way. Well, it has to be eggs. I don't know. My understanding that is you're looking for some calcite material. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you're looking for calcite oxide or something. Yes. Right? Yeah. And this is available in nature. I mean, there's a lot of these calcite oxides mixed with some other. Mm -hmm. And then minerals and so on, which can be also used. Yeah. And there's some other things. You didn't think about it because it's abundant and nobody's using it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's a lot of mountains here. Mesh. I can give you a small device and you can attach it to this 
set up the lab in the lab, mm -hmm. see without it miss this kind of electromagnetic excitation, which has an effect on the fatty material. Okay. It makes it easier to, to, to react or interact with the alcohol and the catalyst. So let us just talk about, we are now looking at alternative heterogeneous, Mm -hmm. We're going to compare with the process of homogeneous using the sodium hydroxide. There's an enhancement in the process, and then I get 20% of any money coming to the university based on my idea. Right? So I'm going to build use this device, it's very easy to build, and I'm going to attach it to your, to your uh, experiment. I have to look at the setup and you can attach it simply. It's a coil. Mm -hmm. So I can put the coil on top of this. Glass container, and you just plug it in the electricity. The electricity comes from a certain high frequency waveform. And we have mm -hmm. the power supply for more reasons. I can give you a power supply to look at it. And you do it without the mess and see whether you have a better chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to later to separate the water from the hydroxide? And Agree? Sounds interesting. Because if you don't do it, I think it's good to promote you to the region. Okay, thank you. That's good. So you can ask for anything. Any other questions? No, I give you for one hour of questions, right?